on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Nicola Thorpe. And I'm Dr David Bull. And here's what's coming up on the show today. It simply beggars belief that a man being held on suspected terror charges was able to escape a prison by clinging to the bottom of a food delivery van. Jailbreak outrage. With escaped terror suspect Daniel Khalif still at large, questions around why he was being held in a Category B prison. Double by-election nightmare, Rishi Sunak faces two difficult votes in October as former Tory whip and groping MP Chris Pincher stands down. And is your washing machine spying on you? What about your doorbell or your smart speaker? A consumer group warns that everyday appliances are mining our data. Well, the big question is, have you had a spooky experience with your smart appliances? Do give us a ring on 0344 499 1000. You can also text the word TALK to 87222 and you can also tweet us at TALK TV. Now, how worried are you about all of these smart appliances? I don't have any smart devices. I have a very stupid home. <laughs> so I have a lot of them and they listen the whole time. So even if you have a conversation with someone about something, whatever it is, then suddenly all the adverts start popping up. And, oh. and so the real concern is, what do they know? I how much like do they know? And what are they telling people? <laughs> I would love to know. I'd like to pay to <laughs> right. see what you talk about. Well, home. you don't really. <laughs> you really don't. <laughs> right, well, first, let's get the news headlines with Emily Rose. Adams. Talk TV News at five. Thanks, Nicola. Police are continuing to hunt a terror suspect who escaped Wandsworth Prison underneath a delivery lorry yesterday morning. 21-year-old Daniel Khalif had been due to go on trial, accused of leaving fake bombs at a military base while serving in the army. He's denied the three charges against him. Extra checks are now being carried out at airports over fears the fugitive might flee the country. David Shipley is a consultant prison inspector who previously served time at HMP Wandsworth, and he's told Talk TV is not uncommon for inmates to go missing within the prison. Wandsworth is, is so big, uh, has such a transient population of prisoners and is very understaffed. And what that means is you have officers who aren't always on the same wings, they're not really familiar with the faces and names of all the men they're supposed to be responsible for, and those faces and names change all the time anyway. So it's very difficult in that situation to actually have a handle on, is that guy supposed to be in that cell? Meanwhile, the government's also announced an independent investigation into the prison escape as questions emerge over why Khalif was being held in a Category B prison rather than a high-security Category A. It's understood the 21-year-old had been labelled a flight risk before escaping. A police investigation is being launched into dozens of baby deaths and injuries at a hospital trust in Nottinghamshire. Nottinghamshire Police says its decision to investigate cases of potentially significant concern follows discussions with senior midwife Donna Ockenden, who's already carrying out a review of the maternity units in the area. Around 1,800 families have been contacted as part of the review. Network Rail has admitted a series of failings which led to the death of three people in a train deal derailment in Aberdeenshire. The train's driver a conductor and a passenger died after the train struck a landslide near Stonehaven in August 2020 and six others were injured. The company pleaded guilty at the High Court in Aberdeen today and admitted failing to impose a speed restriction, warn the driver that part of the track was unsafe or ask him to reduce his speed. And provisional Met Office figures show today has been the hottest day of the year so far. Temperatures have hit 32.6 degrees in Surrey and are expected to rise further as the week continues. Meanwhile, a UK record's also been broken for the number of consecutive September days, reaching 30 degrees with four days in a row. Now time for a closer look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. This has been the fourth consecutive day when temperatures have topped 30 Celsius somewhere in the British Isles and that heat uh, will continue into the weekend as well. Now the humidity has also sparked off a few showers some quite nasty thunderstorms actually just now into Northern Ireland that will continue to ease northwards. Some flashes of lightning, locally heavy rain there but they will tend to decay as they run northwards and then the main theme again tonight is that mist and low cloud will become more extensive particularly uh, across eastern areas coming inland maybe even thick enough for some drizzle and temperatures on the high side again unusually warm for some towns and cities in the south now for Friday, one or two showers perhaps later, but on the whole it's a dry, sunny day with that mist and low cloud retreating back to the coast. Hottest inland temperatures easily again, the mid to high 20s through the afternoon. And in the south, probably by about 3 or 4 p.m., it'll be near at around 30 or 31 Celsius. A muggy and uncomfortable night for sleeping on Friday night takes us into a Saturday where we could well see one or two more showers, but on the whole it's dry, sunny and hot. Highs of 31 to 33. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed to Emily and Isabel. Let's move on to our top story now. And with escaped terror suspect Daniel Khalif still at large, an investigation has now been launched into why the 21-year-old was being held in a Category B prison. It's also emerged that prison officers didn't report his disappearance for an hour following his escape at 7.50 yesterday morning. During a heated face-off in the Commons earlier, the Shadow Justice Secretary demanded answers. Beggars belief that a man being held on suspected terror charges was able to escape a prison by clinging to the bottom of a food delivery van. The simplest question for the Justice Secretary today is how on earth was this allowed to happen? How is such an escape even possible? Why was a suspected uh, terror offender held at a Category B uh, jail whilst on remand, despite many other suspected and indeed convicted terrorists being held in the high security uh, estate? Why was Daniel Khalife moved from Belmarsh to Wandsworth? Launching the independent inquiry into the escape, Alex Chalk insisted that Khalife, who was a flight risk, would be caught. I have ordered an investigation into the categorisation decision by HMPPS. Were all relevant matters taken into consideration in determining where in the custodial estate Daniel Khalif should be held? I have also decided there will need to be an additional independent investigation into this incident and that will take place in due course. Madam Deputy Speaker, Daniel Khalif will be found and he will be made to face justice. Well, let's go live now to outside Wandsworth Prison to talk to our correspondent, Nick Ellaby. Nick, what's the latest? Good afternoon, David. Well, the latest is that there are still many, many more questions than answers. Oh, 32 hours on from Daniel Khalif's escape. I mean, Labour are using this as a big attack line to talk about Britain's failing prison system. Keir Starmer says that this is a case of the government being overstretched. They've had 10 justice secretaries in the last 10 years. Now, one thing that emerged this afternoon is that that food delivery truck was uh, a bid food delivery truck. They're a wholesale supplier. And uh, the company say that uh, the driver fully cooperated with police before returning to the depot. In terms of the search, as far as we know, the police are still concentrating on London. We're here in southwest central London, and Daniel Khalif is known to have contacts and network in Kingston, which is a short trip down the A3 from here. He's also known to have connections in the northwest. But as I say, the police still very much focused on London and, and looking for Britain's most wanted man. And Nick, what can you tell us about the delay between um, the services realising that he'd escaped prison um, and then actually announcing it to the public? 
Well, these are all questions that need to be answered. As you say, the Times reported that there was a delay of one hour between Daniel Khalif escaping, we think at 7.30 yesterday morning, and the police being involved maybe somewhere around 8.30. I did speak to a woman who lives nearby, and she said there were lots of police here at about 8.15 yesterday morning, but they didn't seem to be doing very much, so whether they knew about that or not. And today, I mean, the prison was on lockdown yesterday, but it seems to be more or less here. Business as usual, lots of visitors going in and out. I've spoken to lots of them. They tell me the conditions inside are really grim. There are lots of rats running around the compound, but they're now kind of going through extra treks to try and find out what happened. One woman whose boyfriend is inside, she told me that uh, the prisoners were all strip searched yesterday, trying to look for clues. We know that strapping was found underneath that van. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the real big question is, Daniel Khalif, he's a terror suspect and also a known flight risk. Why was he allowed to work in the kitchen, a job usually reserved for the most trusted prisoners, uh, which I've been told is the least secure part of Wandsworth Prison? Um, Nick, you mentioned the strapping underneath the van. Now, clearly, that would then lead people to think that this was premeditated. The question then is, did he have help from the outside or was this an inside job? Any thoughts? I mean, I can speculate like everybody else can. We don't know whether that strapping was attached to the van when it came in. The security, the, uh, sorry, the Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, did reveal today that all security posts were being manned at 7.30 yesterday morning, which is an interesting detail, which does suggest that he's probably had some help, maybe from the inside. He's certainly going to need help on the outside now. We know he escaped in his chef's clothes, so brown boots, red and white check trousers, and a white T-shirt. Uh, he's going to need money. He's going to need a roof over his head. He's going to need to find somewhere to stay. So, as I say, a lot of questions to be answered about the prison service uh, and a lot of questions for the police at the moment. And, Nick, what can you tell us about the speculation that um, part of these allegations were that Daniel was collecting information for Iran? Can you expand on that at all? Well, so this guy is 21. He was a computer engineer in the Royal Signal Corps based in Staffordshire. Uh, the accusation, we'd known he was, he'd had three charges, one under the Terror Act. Um, he was also, well, it emerged today. We knew he was accused of gathering secrets for a potentially hostile nation. It emerged today that that was Iran. Um, and, uh, yeah, police are, are looking into, uh, into all of that at the moment. He's due to stand trial at Woolwich Crown Court in November. Um, if they find him, then escaping from prison will be added to that list of charges as well. Thank you so much, Nick Ellaby, there outside Wandsworth Prison. Well, joining us in the studio now is General Secretary of the Prison Officers Association, Steve Gillen. Also down the line is former HMP Wandsworth prisoner David Shipley. Uh, let, let's come to you, if we can, Steve. Just in terms of this, uh, can you just explain how this could possibly happen? I understand there is terrible out overcrowding going on at Wandsworth, so it's actually built for 900 prisoners. There are something like 1,500. Is it simply the case that actually the prison officers are overwhelmed they've got far too much work to do and there aren't enough of them well there's lots going on here Let, let's firstly take uh, Wandsworth prison uh, as a single entity Wandsworth prison holds 1600 just over 1600 mm. prisoners mm. it's the most overcrowded Britain uh, place in Britain mm. um, there's something called <coughs> certified normal accommodation which is what is supposed to be held there, and it's just over 900 prisoners, yeah. one per cell. Mm. So you've got, effectively, 600-odd prisoners that are overcrowded. So you're about 60 to 80% over where you should be, basically. Yeah. Coupled with that, you've got the added contribution of severe budget cuts since 2010, during the austerity years, mm. where they ripped out 10,000 prison officers and made them redundant. Mm. That, that, that is a fact. There's no getting away from that. Then that was replaced. Then they, they sort of, I think, when Liz Truss became Secretary of State in 2016-17, we identified this shortness. We'd constantly talked about it. It's interesting. Everybody wants to talk about prisons when something goes wrong but they don't want to talk about prisons generally. And I understand that, mm. because it's not as sexy as talking about education, mm. nursing, 
placing different things. So we know we come down the pecking order, but it's a vital public service mm. that our members do in a very, very hostile and difficult environment. So I'll start by saying, because I think it's really important, nobody wants to see anybody escape from prison. No. Mm. It is a serious, serious issue, and we recognise that yeah. as a trade union. As the employer and government, I think government have got to take a wee bit of responsibility in this. They're the ones that have cut our numbers mm. of prison officers from 2010. Do you know we're still 2,400 prison officers in deficit mm. in 2020? And, 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 and you're right to say that because also the current population is 84,000. Capacity yeah. of prisons in this country is meant to be 78,000. Mm. So we're way over. The government knows this, actually. I think all political parties knows this. Yeah. And actually, they are, aren't they building more prisons? We build more prisons, but is that the answer? I, I'm not 100% sure it is. And I think in, in England and Wales, I, I, I don't talk about Scotland or Northern Ireland because they're separate mm. um, countries in respect of um, prisoner populations. But all political parties use um, prisons and crime as a political football, quite frankly, mm. trying to point score off each other and to come out with dreadful policies that actually affects my members and the prisoners in our care. And it's my members that have got to open up these prisoners. Let's take Wandsworth, for example, yesterday. And the reason we didn't come out straight away, because we wanted to think carefully about what we were going to say and we wanted the true picture, because there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of misinformation put around the media, such as that this prisoner was transferred from Belmarsh to Wandsworth. And he wasn't. He wasn't, yeah. You know, the Secretary of State, who I've got a reasonable relationship with, and it won't come as any surprise to Alex Chalk we're raising all the issues mm. about resourcing, funding. Your viewers won't be aware, but at any one time in this country, every single day, there is 300 prison officers moving around the country called detached duty to fill gaps in the system. And it's costing the taxpayer, just in hotel bills, one million pound a month. Mm. Wow. What do you see as the solution to this to make well, sure that you know, this kind of mm. thing doesn't happen well, again? You're absolutely right, because it's OK me coming on here, highlighting the problems, mm. but there's got to be solutions going forward. And I think we've got to get back to a situation where we've got a properly resourced prison, where we've got experienced staff to get rid of 100,000 years of, a, of prison experienced officers. And I feel sorry for the young officers coming in to environments such as Wandsworth and other difficult prisons. Now, I think the solution, getting to the solution, and we've been calling for it for quite some time, and it actually was in the Conservative Manifesto in 2019, and have not carried it through, and that is a public inquiry, a royal commission, not just into prisons, but into the whole criminal justice system, from our courts to policing to probation, mm. and ultimately to prisons because they're in crisis, the whole lot combined. Uh, and it comes back to the thing we've talked about, I think, pretty much every single day, is about continuity across all political parties, making sure we have a long-term strategy. Let's bring in David Shipley, if we can. Uh, now, David, you're a former <coughs> prisoner at Wandsworth, but you also right. now inspect prisons as well. What are your thoughts on Wandsworth? i also be very intrigued to know what your thoughts are on why uh, this individual was actually held at Wandsworth instead of Belmarsh, particularly if he was seen as a flight risk? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, yes, I, I was a prisoner at Wandsworth in 2020, and since then I've worked as a consultant inspector and I write and talk about prison issues. Uh, I think it's strange that he was held at Wandsworth if he was considered a flight risk, because if you compare Wandsworth to a prison like Belmarsh, this never would have happened there. That's a much more secure establishment uh, having spoken to people I know who've spent time at both prisons, there's no way he'd have got out there. Uh, I think the big questions have already been raised. They're around why he was working in the kitchen, how he was able to escape under a lorry when every vehicle leaving the prison should be checked above and below. Uh, and yeah, the, those are very, very obvious questions. More widely, though, I think there is this, this issue of the prison service being underfunded and understaffed. And I think the fact that the alert, alert wasn't raised for an hour doesn't really surprise me in the case of Wandsworth, because when I was there, they would often lose prisoners for extended periods of time. 
So they'll probably have been running around checking and just trying to make sure that he wasn't on a different wing in someone else's cell before the alarm was raised. How, how, sorry, how, how can you lose prisoners? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I think one of the first jobs of a prison is, is to know where the people in prisons are. But I think at Wandsworth, you've got a very, very unusual population. About half of the prisoners there are foreign nationals awaiting extradition. And the rest of the prisoners are a mixture of remand cases facing trial or waiting sentencing. And people have been sentenced to short sentences and some longer sentence prisoners awaiting transfers. It's a real mix. It changes all the time. And that combined with the high number of uh, sorry, the, the low number of, of staff and the, the high turnover of staff, in fact, the staff have to be moved around wings, means often staff won't really know who should be on what wing. Mm. Mm. The result of that is it's very easy for prisoners to sneak off to a different wing during a time when they're moving around to go into someone else's cell. And it will only be when counts are done that, that it will be noticed that someone was not in the right place and then there's a process of looking for mm. them. And David, can I just ask you a little bit more about the role of kitchen staff within uh, the prison? Mm. I believe it's quite a respected role. He'd only been there, I believe, since February early this year. It seems like quite a quick transition to go from having entered the prison to work your way up into the kitchen, which is, is seen as quite, yeah, a plum job mm -hmm. within the prison, as it were. It's definitely one of the, what seems one of the best jobs for a prisoner in Wandsworth. It gives you loads of time out of your cell, you get as much food as you might want, uh, you, and there's an opportunity to take extra food and trade it with other prisoners. So it's absolutely a very in-demand job. Six months in a prison is probably long enough in Wandsworth to, to be one of the, the longer-serving prisoners there because of this high churn rate. And if he's made the effort to be a model prisoner, to get on the right side of the, the prison staff, then it's not necessarily surprising that he would be in a kitchen job in that time. What does make it surprising is that someone who's a flight risk was given that job because in the kitchens you are right there. Uh, you're interfacing with the delivery trucks that come in and out every day. So your opportunity to escape is probably higher there than in almost any other prison job. And can I just ask as well, I believe Daniel's 21 years old. Would that have changed, was it, would his kind of youth as it were, have changed the way he was treated within the prison either by other prisoners or by the guards? Well, that's a great question. I think uh, for, the, the average age of a prisoner in Wandsworth is, is probably early 20s, so I think he wouldn't have been out of place. Uh, presumably, he's a strong, healthy guy, having been in the army, so you know he may have been considered suitable for physically demanding jobs, which the kitchen can be. Lovely. Well, thank you for joining us. Steve Gillen in the studio and David Shipley down the line. Coming up after the break, former Tory whip Chris Pincher stands down as an MP, bringing yet another by-election headache for Rishi Sunak. I'm Nicola Thor. And I'm Dr David Bull. We're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk here on TV, radio and online.
Welcome back. Now, Rishi Sunak is now facing two more by-elections in October. Chris Pincher quit this morning, having lost an appeal against his suspension in the Commons, adding to the pressure brought by Nadine Dorries' resignation. Pincher is a former whip. He was a former minister and MP for Tamworth, who was facing a recall petition after allegedly groping two men in a London club. It will be, wait for this, the fifth by-election test for the Tories since June. Well, joining us now is Aubrey Allegretti, senior pol political correspondent at The Guardian. Thank you so much for coming in, Aubrey. Rumours that the by-elections might take place on the same day, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So this is a Conservative held seat, so it's in the Conservative Party's hands as to when to hold the election. Uh, we have the Mid-Bedfordshire by-election that's supposed to be taking place, I think, on the 19th of October. And so at the start of next week, we're expecting the government whips to formally announce the date for the Tamworth by-election as well. It will probably be the same date as the Mid-Beds one. And why is that? Is that to mitigate any problems? I mean, when you look at those seats, when you actually look at uh, Tamworth, so the Tories got in with 30,000, Labour was on 11,000. You need something like a 21% swing for Labour to win that. But that would be considered a safe seat normally. But of course, in today's crazy Nothing politics, safe. there's no such thing as a safe seat. It's all changed, hasn't it? Mm. I mean, 19,000 should be an enormous hill to climb. And yet we saw last, uh, over the summer, we saw the Selby and Ainsley seat swing against the Conservatives. They had a majority of 23,000. That was brushed aside by Labour, who sort of walked straight through. But then you also see Uxbridge as well, which the Conservatives retained by about 500 but that votes. that was you, Les. It was. So mm. it's not as though all Conservative safe seats are now up for grabs, but it will give the Tories lots more jitters mm. than otherwise. How do you think Rishi's going to spin this, though? He had you, Les, last time. He doesn't have that you, Les, thing to fall back on. Uh, do you think there actually could Take it, both of And the, the tricky thing as well about this by-election is because the boundaries are moving at the next election, mm, yeah. the Conservatives have already got their candidate lined up for the new seat, who is Eddie Hughes. He's an incumbent Conservative MP. So the Conservatives are going to have to pick somebody who potentially is only the MP from this by-election until the next election. That isn't a very good sell. So they were in a bit of a mess there as well. In so terms so of would that candidate. be someone in their latter years who maybe is looking for a final position, for example? Potentially, but it's a very hard sell to the electorate, right? So yeah. Eddie Hughes is going to have to now make a decision about whether or not he relinquishes his new seat, knowing that that means he could be sort of lose his job in the Commons forever, or try and hang on and go back in 18 months' time whenever the next election is. Mm. But voters will have already elected a new MP there, so it's a total mess. So, so just in terms of this, Chris Pincher, is it, is it the case that actually he jumped before he was pushed? I mean, clearly, obviously, he lost the case. He's realised the game is up. That's exactly right, yes. So he was facing an eight-week suspension from Parliament and anything more than ten sitting days, so two working weeks effectively, mm. is enough to trigger a recall petition, which if 10% of your constituents sign it would trigger a by-election as well. Mm. He's been a pretty absent figure in the constituency and, of course, in the wider sort of Westminster scene since last July, which was when the allegations first mm. emerged. So there are lots of people who were very unhappy and probably would have been willing but to sign up. But also he should have stood down, shouldn't yes. he, in July 2022? Yes. Also, I was just looking, he's pocketed £122,000 since then of taxpayer money. Yeah, he's continued to take his salary as an MP and there are limited amounts the Conservatives can do because they withdrew the whip from him, so they effectively sort of lost being able to control him. So it all ended up in a very difficult situation. It's um, one of the landmines of the sort of Boris Johnson era yes. still going <laughs> off. I was just going to say that because ultimately that led, well, I mean, so many things led to Boris Johnson's downfall, but that really was the straw that broke the camel's back was the fact that, you know, Boris got called out for having promoted this guy, knowing there were such complaints made against him. Exactly. There was a sort of tidal wave of anger within the Conservative Party building about Boris Johnson. And it was not Partygate that led MPs to sort of suddenly oust him. Yeah. It was the fact that Chris Pincher was promoted to this position of being the Deputy Chief Whip, who is in charge of things like discipline and welfare in mm. February of that year, and then Number 10 denied that there had been any warnings received about his behaviour before. That turned out to not to be true, so it was the sort of final lie from that administration. Mm. And, of course, the government's majority, what is it, 57? I think it was much higher, wasn't it, when they first came in? So, of course, that, that has huge ramifications. Let's just talk about Horizon. I think this is a really interesting story, actually. The fact is that we're rejoining Horizon with a discounted membership fee. Now, this is being spun in every single newspaper <laughs> as being a great thing uh, because, obviously, the Remainers are very excited about 
about it. I think some Brexiteers haven't actually read the detail. What's your take on it? Yeah, I think that's probably a fair enough assessment. I mean, Lord Frost, who was obviously the person who sort of partially negotiated how this was all going to work, said he had negotiated the UK's access to Horizon way back when, but the EU had sort of refused to accept it because there was this ongoing row about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mm. That was sort of slightly fixed in February of this year when the Windsor framework was brought into play, slightly being the opposite Slightly, word. that's why I looked at you like <laughs> um, yeah. So this is kind of the next step in the sort of journey towards trying to patch up those relationships. There was quite a hard cut when Brexit happened and now there's sort of a bit more gentle stitching going on. And for our viewers who aren't aware of what Horizon is, can you give us a little bit of background of what's happened since we left the EU and what the actual Horizon project is? Absolutely. So it's a sort of scientific research pool worth, I think, about £90 billion. And it effectively means that research companies, universities can draw on it and collate projects with other research institutions across the EU. So you can take the sort of AI research bit from one university in one country and the sort of genomics department from another country, stitch them all together and hopefully come up with something that becomes much more world leading. It's a really renowned project across mm. the world. It's quite unique. So, so I would say this, wouldn't I? Because I'm obviously a Brexiteer and I stood for that and I believe in it passionately. But reading and talking to fellow MEPs or former MEPs, they're very concerned about what this means. The devil is in the detail here. Also, I was reading that the European Defence Fund has been folded into this. This is basically, there's so much more going on below the surface here. So promoting EU military union, PESCO's gone into it. So again, how much of this is us seceding sovereignty? Wasn't that the whole point of Brexit? Yeah, and Rishi Sunak was sort of very cagey today when he was asked, is this the start of kind of approaching closer relationship with Brussels and the EU more generally? And sort of was very <laughs> keen not to get drawn on that. But it is what some people f worry about. Yeah. And it's what most, well, I think most people now, according to the polls, actually want is to have deals with Rubbish. the EU, not Rubbish. necessarily to rejoin the EU. <laughs> but look, if you look at all the scientists today, 70% of cancer well, research scientists. Well, they will, scientists, they will, because of course they get research grants. So they which will is so be important, but we want our cancer research scientists to be able to access those bigger grants, to be able to work with our European There's a global power. platform. Your thoughts on that? We'll, we're not going to agree. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> I think uh, uh, it's part of Rishi Sunak sort of trying to be a leader on the world stage again. It mm. comes after the Windsor Framework. It's no coincidence that this is coming roughly the same time he's flying to Delhi for the G20 summit. Yeah. But the problem is that those kind of big global things are not necessarily vote winners. So they might make him very popular abroad and with other world leaders, but not necessarily with that many voters back home, mm. which is what he needs right now. And of course, it's worth remembering it's going to cost us two billion quid so every single year. So it's worth remembering. But Aubrey. we'll have access to 90 billion quid as a result. <laughs> We're still on. Come on, you. David. Aubrey, let's move th on. thank you very much indeed. Aubrey will actually be staying with us after the break, where we'll be discussing Rishi Sunak's decision to block plans that would have banned pupils from changing their gender. I'm Dr. David Bull. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. We're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, and online. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Uh, yes, Labour absolutely. 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the polls. No, no, can we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it?
There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll. If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this now. <laughs> Get Meghan Markle, about Get Meghan Markle. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should we be concerned? <laughs> <honestly>? <laughs> If it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Now, Rishi Sunak is expected to block plans that would have banned pupils from changing their gender by choosing another pronoun or wearing a different uniform. It's after he's warned that any such ban would leave his government on the wrong side of history. The Conservatives have been weighing up whether to prohibit school children from so-called socially transitioning. However, the Attorney General concluded that such a move would be unlawful under the Equality Act. Well, the Guardian senior political correspondent Aubrey Allegretti is still with us. Alongside LGBTQ plus commentator Sam Dowler. Sam, I'm going to come to you first. Can you give us a little bit of background um, as to what this story is all about? Well, this is, I mean, this is such a contentious issue and we, we, all, we all know about it. And, you know, you have, I mean, let's just start with this. The, the, the whole trans issue, let's say, has been bubbling along for the last couple of years and it's been dragged into the culture war, especially with the Tories. Um, Lee Anderson, for example, said that, um, said that it should be, you know, how, how they're going to fight the next election. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's appalling that uh, trans people, who are some of the most vulnerable people in the society, are even, are even used as these political pawns especially trans children. So obviously there has been a bit of an uptick with, um, with kids socially transitioning, transitioning and there's also, um, you know, there's, there's the whole um, emergence of people who don't even fit into the binary gender, so a non-binary person. So for, so for people at home who have literally no idea what you're talking about, just explain that. So can you explain social transitioning? This is where, because we're talking about children here, mm. we're not just mm. talking about the trans community, we're talking mm. about all children. So yeah. in terms of socially transitioning, my understanding, this is about uh, how children maybe want to dress, how yeah. they want to be referred to. Yeah, absolutely. It, so this is, I'm going to use a friend of mine as an example, a friend of mine from school, her, her daughter has come out as non-binary and uh, chooses to use um, a male name at school and then uses her female name at home. She dresses um, in a way, sometimes she might look like a boy, sometimes she might look like a girl, but then the whole idea of this is that, you know, what is looking like a boy, what is looking like a girl? Do you know what I mean? Like, just why, why, why should, gender is, a is gender is a construct, 15. Gender is a construct that we we have created. No, and it's own, not. And you it. have a biological sex. No. That's, oh, that's sex, sex, not gender. gender let's okay. take, gender let's take our cases. outfits, yeah. for example. Mine yeah. and David's here. Yeah. If we're talking about a school uniform, say, mm -hmm. I'm wearing trousers. Yeah. In many schools, that would be a male item of clothing. Yeah. You're wearing a pink shirt. And you would be allowed so in many some places, schools. It, would, pink. it is it's quite <laughs> it's pink. pink. But <laughs> people would say, oh, you know, pink's for girls. Mm. And maybe like 20 years ago, that would have been so incredibly strict. But there are still schools today who say, no, girls have to 
have to mm. do and wear skirts. What on earth has wearing a skirt got to do with your gender? Imagine you were told to, you had to wear a skirt to work here. Oh. Do you know what I mean? You'd be like, what? I'd store where, off. where is this? You know, are we in Russia? It's yeah. ridiculous. So, I mean, so this is, so this obviously is to do with children. And the mm. thing is, when it comes to um, LGBTQ stuff at the moment, this is um, where people want to be the most angry. They, they, they ring this bell saying like, oh, what did somebody think of the children? When it's not about that, that's why it's such a hoo-ha about Drag Queen Story Hour, etc. which obviously, again, has nothing to do with, you know, it makes me really angry because, I mean, even if you, even now, because of this rhetoric, when I, for example, write about, for example, the, um, the Kew Gardens queer thing that was um, that they're, that they're promoting, um, queer like botanicals, like I mean, talking about you know gender within within you know plants, Banks, yeah, yeah, it has been um, has been you know vilified here and there. And I spoke about it, and then I was called a groomer on online um, at paedophile. So I mean, this this is where we're at. This is where the rhetoric has got to. And people like Suella Bravham and Kemi, and Kemi Badnock have like have you know they have got a lot to answer for. For goodness sakes, this is this is you know this but, this is appalling. And they're key. And they're key. They're, for example, with Suella's speech the other day about about police police not being, you know, fraternising with LGBTQ people. I mean, it's an outrage. So, so just playing devil's advocate here, because dressing up and being in trousers or being in a skirt or whatever is a completely normal part of growing up. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily define how you want to be seen. Yeah. And I think it's really confusing. I'm a medic by training. And of course, I think it is incredibly difficult. When you look at the truly number of trans children, actually it's low. So many of these children, and there are many studies saying that many of them suffer from things like depression or mm -hmm. they or, or, or problems with uh, how they want to be perceived. But Aubrey, can I just bring you in here? Because if I'm confused, if the public are confused, the politicians must be very confused. <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. I mean, what's going on here really is a split at the sort of top of government. So you have ministers who have different opinions who think that this issue should be treated differently. And the Attorney General sort of weighed in and basically complicated things by saying, if you want to issue this guidance to schools that says what you wanted to say, then you'll have to change the law. There is one sort of final year left of this parliament. So Rishi Sunak has about 12 months left to do that. But he's got a whole host of other things that he wants to do. He's got quite limited time. He doesn't want MPs to be stuck in Westminster. Mm -hmm. He wants them to be in their constituencies instead. So it's about whether or not he wants to take the political time to spend the next 12 months having a very public row within his party to sort of for the sake of appeasing certain people that you just mentioned. And it would be a change to the Equality Act, as I understand it, because at the moment there are certain protected characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, race, religion, uh, disability, uh, sex and gender identity. Mm. And you'd have to completely tear up the fabric of the Equality Act but in where, order to... Where, where, not... where are we as a country if we want to, as you say, tear up the fabric of the Equalities Act? Yeah. And also when, you know, uh, and even talking about... Um, you know, leaving the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, really, is that where we are as a country? Is that is that is that where we want to go? It's, no. It, it, it looks, you know, it that looks... wraps it up in obviously the migrant crisis. That's why they're yes, of for course. That to be... But like this, but like this, why is this been sure. shoehorned into that as well? Do we are we are we that cruel of a country? We've already like we've already plummeted down the rank the rankings of what, um, what safety for LGBTQ people in the whole in the whole of the world. Look, as you know, I, I'm all in favour of equality, and obviously the the LGBTQ plus community has been has had a very hard time uh, as I know only too well but just in terms of this for those parents who are deeply concerned about their children th I said at the beginning that actually the, there there is a minority there's a very small group of, mm. of young people growing up who are truly trans just where do you stand on having a corrective surgery for example or having medical intervention before the age of 18 where do I personally stand mm. on that well I mean okay let's take for example the whole argument about um, trans women in sport so, um, so certain bodies say that um, if somebody has transitioned before puberty, then they will be allowed to to participate. Yeah. However, if they're not allowed to transition before puberty, then how? But the, that's a moot point. Then there's no there's no point mm. even saying it. So, or you look at a pop star like uh, Kim Petras, for example, who was one of the youngest people to transition in the world, and you know, and has gone on to flourish as she has. I mean, this is this. This is such a contentious issue, but it, is, it should be done in a case-by-case -case basis. Like if, like if, if somebody wants to, um, you know, wear a binder, for example, or to, or to, or to, you know, uh, project 
a different gender than they uh, they were born in, then that is that is their prerogative, and a parent should talk to their child about it and go along with them and and, and see what and it's all to make them comfortable, to make them happy. Mm. And Aubrey, David's so right, isn't he? It's a very very small percentage of children and trans people who go on to socially transition as adults mm, exactly. or medically mm. transition. Yet this is spoken about as if it's happening to all kids in schools and every parent should be scared. Do you think the government are really using this to fear monger in the run-up to the next election? It does take up a sort of disproportionate amount, if you like, of political bandwidth. Mm. Yeah. And that's partly because the people who are nervous about the sort of direction that they think that we're heading in think that this has sort of wider... Um, difficulties for the country and they want to sort of put a stop to this now before it kind of gets too far. The culture war dynamic, the Conservatives still haven't really figured out mm. how much they want to lean into. I sort of feel like Rishi Sunak is reluctant but sort of wants to show a little bit of ankle to Conservative voters to sort of get them to turn out on polling day. So, so he's got to be very clear, hasn't he, what are his priorities as the general election approaches? And, of course, as you as you rightly say, does he really want to rattle that cage? I guess? Exactly, yeah. There are much bigger things on most people's agenda. The economy, mm. he's talked about stopping mm. small boats. And, um, you know, is this really the sort of thing that he wants to spend the next 12 months talking about, drawing yeah. attention to? You can't have that many priorities. It's the very definition of a priority that you're supposed to only have a few. <laughs> yes. Right, well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Aubrey Allegretti and Sam Dowler there. Right, coming up after the break, is your washing machine spying on you? That's the warning from consumer experts who say the unlikeliest of household gadgets are harvesting our data. Wow, sounds absolutely frightening. <laughs> this is Nicola Thorpe, I'm Dr David Bull. We're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk here on TV, on radio, and of course, online.
Welcome back. Now, everyday devices such as smart speakers, doorbell cameras, TVs, and even washing machines could be spying on us in our own homes. That's what that's the warning, sorry, from consumer group Witch, who found that household appliances are often collecting data without our knowledge. Yes, they found that some washing machines are collecting users' names, dates of birth, emails, and even have access to photos on their phone. Oh my goodness, right, to make sense of all of this, we're joined by consumer journalists from which Harry Kind. Harry, give us a bit of background, please. We're not saying that the yes. washing machines are taking over. No, no, yes. by uh, just stealing all our pants and just leaving <laughs> us uh, commando. No, what this basically is, is that whenever you get a smart device, so that's anything that can connect to the internet, you often have to, you have to set that up with an app. And when you download that app, it will ask for your permissions. So it will say, can we have permission to access your location, your photos, your contacts, a whole plethora of different things. And we find that a lot of those just aren't necessary for the functioning of your washing machine, for your toaster, for a smart doorbell. And so we think that basically these companies, they're being a bit greedy with mm. the, uh, the data that they ask for. But I think in terms of the consumer, when mm. you're setting it up, you're so bored being asked uh, all the time about this stuff yeah, that people just yeah. go, yes, fine, Absolutely. accept all. And actually, I don't think you should do that. I think you should be very careful yes. you have only essential stuff and don't share all the data. There's no reason your washing machine needs to know your date of birth. That, absolutely. And, and the, the problem is, you could say the advice, well, read the privacy policy, read the terms and conditions. Well, to do that for a Google Nest, for example, would take 20,000 words or about an hour and 20 minutes. No. So it's not practical. And so you need these, um, you know, summaries of what data you're giving away. And for the default to mm. not necessarily be you know, allow all, give as much data as possible, but just to be a bit more kind of sparing with that. Mm. Do consumers have an option generally to not enter this information? Is it just that we're so used to it that we just click through? It, it varies. So there are some uh, washing machines, for example, that wouldn't work unless you put in your date of birth. Now that's not that useful. Uh, whereas some items will just be uh, encouraging you to give all of that extra data. And if you didn't provide that, well, your experience wouldn't be any worse. In fact, in some cases, it might be better. For example, with smart TVs, those will have a tracking feature on what you're watching so that their advertising on the TV itself can be targeted. Now, you are perfectly entitled to turn that off, yeah. but in the setup when you're so anxious to get the new TV working, you would just allow all and not even realise. Of course you would. And of course, this goes back to the Internet of Things. We were talking about that in the break. Mm -hmm. They all talk to each other. And yes. of course, it seems very exciting. I was saying that I can turn my boiler on with my phone, I can turn lights on, I can do all sorts of things. I yeah. can turn security cameras on. But of course, there is a, a price to pay. You're giving away your personal information to yeah. have all of that access. You are. And, and sometimes that's, even in the legitimate uses, that can be negative. So that's tracking information to allow advertisers to sell you things better. Mm. But then even in, when you think about the, the dark side of it, is that you give your data over and trust that that's going to be looked after. And we've seen in the last few weeks public services being hacked or leaking data. Police, yeah. Private mm. companies losing our data all the time. And so even if you uh, agree with the terms and conditions, you don't then have complete control over that data and you could well lose it because your identity is worth something mm. to, to hackers, to con artists, to mm. people who want to commit identity fraud. Um, UCL are doing an amazing bit of research mm. at the moment into the internet of things and gender mm. uh, and domestic violence and abuse because of course, if somebody were that way inclined, um, they would be able to say, for example, a, a, in, install stalkerware, mm -hmm. or w even without stalkerware, would be able to spy on their victim at yeah. home, would be able mm. to talk to them or taunt them through a doorbell simply by hacking into their device. Yeah, and and, and even, you know, something as um, inane as, as a smart light switch, I have got that set up on my account. If I were to leave my partner, I could then just say, well, I'm going to brick this light switch. That light switch is going to be of no use. No, they're not committing any crime necessarily there, but I've just left them literally in the dark. Mm -hmm. and, and that is really problematic. And, and do, when you did this research, did you find any particular devices or indeed systems mm. were worse than others? Uh, we did. So we, we found uh, some cases with, uh, with some smart cameras, uh, a Chinese ma manufacturer, I believe it's called EasyViz, um, had so much tracking information. So that was sharing your data with other companies. In this case, Huawei, 
the Chinese mobile phone company with TikTok and their targeting, as well as the usual kind of Google and Meta, which just means that all of those companies can target you with very suspiciously accurate advertising. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is we just don't know what data here is being shared. And very quickly, sorry, I was yeah. just going to ask the role of the Information Commissioner. Well, the Information Commissioner could be giving stricter guidance, which just says, don't ask for data that you don't need. Yeah. How can we protect people or how can we tell people to protect themselves? Be very careful about giving permissions when you get a new app. And if need be, find out what permissions will be required for a new smart device before you buy it. Yeah, it sounds like just say no. Just I, I mean, I have, to say, I have to say, Alexa listens the whole time to all, all the conversations, even when you haven't asked her. I mean, yeah. we're entering a very tricky world, I think. And you've um, just triggered everyone's at home. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can't say that word. No, uh, I we? give a fake date of birth. Um, so I like to think, and fake names all the time. Very good. I've got many different aliases. Oh, you're very good at this. <laughs> Happy 29th birthday. <laughs> yes, actress through and through. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Harry Kine. Coming up after the break, grieving parents turned NHS whistleblowers. The couple who helped launch an investigation into baby deaths in Nottingham will join us. I'm Dr David Bull. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. And you're with Talk on TV, radio and, as always, online. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Welcome back. I'm Dr. David Bull. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. We're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz, coming up in the next hour.
maternity scandal. The police launch an inquiry into baby deaths and injuries in Nottingham, with up to 1,800 families thought to be affected, the biggest of its kind in the UK. It simply beggars belief that a man being held on suspected terror charges was able to escape a prison by clinging to the bottom of a food delivery van. Jailbreak outrage with escaped terror suspect Daniel Khalif still at large. Questions around why he was being held in a Category B prison. And Royal Rumbles, an unexpected meeting for Prince William in a Bournemouth pret while his estranged brother touches down in London. Well, of course, you can give us a ring on 0344 499 1000. You can also text the word TALK to 8722. You can also tweet us at TALK TV. Prince William in a pret. I know, it's you rather brilliant. The day. It's rather brilliant, isn't it? And, of course, we'll be covering that. And, of course, the, the latest with Harry and your best friend, Meghan. Well, we'll find out <laughs> later. But first, let's get the news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Talk TV News at six. Thanks, Nicola. Police say there have been no confirmed sightings of fugitive Daniel Khalif since he escaped Wandsworth Prison yesterday, despite receiving more than 50 calls from the public. The 21-year-old had been due to go on trial, accused of leaving fake bombs at a military base while serving in the army, as well as collecting information for Iran. He's denied the charges against him. Extra checks are being carried out at airports over fears he might flee the country. Steve Gillen, the General Secretary of the Prison Officers Association, has told us prisons up and down the country are struggling to cope with the number of inmates due to a lack of funding. Nobody wants to see anybody escape from prison. Mm -hmm. It is a serious, serious issue and we recognise that yeah. as a trade union. As the employer and government, I think government have got to take a wee bit of responsibility in this. They're the ones that have cut our numbers mm -hmm. of prison officers from 2010. Do you know we're still 2,400 prison officers in deficit? Meanwhile, the government's also announced an independent investigation into the prison escape as questions emerge yeah, over why Khalif was being held in a Category B prison rather than high security Category A. It's understood the 21-year-old had been labelled a flight risk before escaping. Well, the Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, says the government is already taking steps to increase security at prisons across the country. We have put in £100 million into enhanced gate security, also X-ray scanners which can check for uh, illegally concealed contraband. That is driving up seizures and driving down violence in prisons. Of course there is more to do, but that investment is yielding really significant results. Five former Met Police officers have pleaded guilty to sending grossly offensive racist WhatsApp messages, including some about the Duchess of Sussex. They entered their guilty pleas to a variety of different counts at Westminster Magistrates Court this afternoon. One of them, Robert Lewis, was a Home Office official before being dismissed for gross misconduct last November. The men, all in their 60s, retired from the force between 2001 and 2015. Network Rail has admitted a series of failings which led to the death of three people in a train derailment in Aberdeenshire. The train's driver, conductor and a passenger died after the train struck a landslide near Stonehaven in August 2020 and six others were injured. The company pleaded guilty at the High Court in Aberdeen today and admitted failing to impose a speed restriction, warn the driver that part of the track was unsafe or ask him to reduce his speed. Provisional Met Office figures show today has been the hottest day of the year so far. Temperatures have hit 32.6 degrees in Surrey and are expected to rise further as the week continues. Meanwhile, a UK record has been broken for the number of consecutive September days reaching 30 degrees with four days in a row. And Ryanair's boss Michael O'Leary has been hit in the face with cream pies by activists protesting against the airline's environmental record. It happened at a press conference in front of the EU Commission's building in Brussels. Well, he wasn't injured and is said to have been disappointed that the cream was soy-based and not real. Well, now for a closer look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. This has been the fourth consecutive day when temperatures have topped 30 Celsius somewhere in the British Isles and that heat uh, will continue into the weekend as well. Now the humidity has also sparked off a few showers some quite nasty thunderstorms actually just now into Northern Ireland that will continue to ease northwards. Some flashes of lightning there is coming inland, maybe even thick enough for some drizzle and temperatures on the high side again. Unusually warm for some towns and cities in the south. Now for Friday, one or two showers perhaps later, but on the whole it's a dry, sunny day with that mist and low cloud retreating back to the coast. Hottest inland temperatures easily again, the mid to high 20s through the afternoon. And in the south, probably by about 3 or 4 p.m., it'll be near around 30 or 31 Celsius. A muggy and uncomfortable night for sleeping on Friday night takes us into a Saturday where we could well see one or two more showers, but on the whole it's dry, sunny and hot. Highs of 31 to 33. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much to Emily and Nazani. Now on to our top story and the maternity scandal that is threatening to engulf Nottingham's NHS Trust. Police have today launched an investigation into nearly 2,000 baby deaths and injuries at maternity units in the city. That is the largest ever carried out in the United Kingdom. Issues at the Trust were first raised by whistleblowers Sarah and Dr Jack Hawkins, whose baby Harriet was stillborn as a result of a mismanaged labour in 2016. And this week, Sarah tweeted this poignant image with the words, Harriet should be going to school today, our beautiful seven-year-old whose life was stolen from us. The empty cries, laughter and shoes. We will be forever be proud of Harriet. Well, Dr Jack uh, joins us now. Thank you for joining us uh, today. This is uh, bittersweet, I suppose, uh, for you. Um, how are you feeling about this? Uh, delighted, really. We've been um, whistleblowing to the right people about the right things for a very, very long time. Um, I think one of the things that we have to recognise is that whilst every other large organisation that we've um, tried to get help from has required considerable efforts from us, which we'll call fighting, to um, to take us seriously and to take our, our children's deaths and harms seriously. We didn't have to do that with the police. So that's that's really welcomed. And Jack, if you don't mind, and obviously if you feel comfortable sort of talking about it, do you mind taking us back to what actually happened back in 2016 and what first kind of made you realise that something wasn't quite right? Um, so Sarah was completely fit and well, Harriet was completely fit and well, I'm completely fit and well. We contacted the hospital when Sarah started labour and um, there were a few episodes where the care was good enough, but multiple episodes where the care was anything but good enough. Um, but we were reassured, bullied um, into accepting their advice. You're not in labour, women in labour don't behave like this, all sorts of things which are the key themes about the maternity failures in Nottingham. Massive doses of opiates and sent home, um, told that we could be readmitted just with a phone call. We made that phone call and they said it doesn't work like that and redid everything on the phone and told us a different story, said stay home. Um, eventually, when they took us seriously, we got into hospital. It was an emergency, but they treated it as if it wasn't, admitted us to birth sanctuary, repeatedly scanned Sarah's tummy until they eventually realised that her bladder was full, which they drained and then turned and said, I'm sorry, your baby's dead. Oh, my, oh my goodness. Um, six pounds, 12 ounces, full term, nothing wrong with her at all. And at that point, we, at that instant, apart from just the ground swallowing us up, we recognised that things had gone wrong and we started blowing the whistle from that point. So you, you said sometimes the care was good enough and sometimes it was not good enough. What Can you just outline that care, just in terms of how you felt it wasn't good enough, what they did, what they didn't do? Also, one other question I have for you. Did you actually know lines of command? Did people take responsibility for the decisions they made? I'll answer that one first. No, no one has taken responsibility. 
um, our apologies from them. They've changed recently, but our apologies at the time were repeatedly, we reiterate our condolences. You know, it's like they knocked our dog over or something. Um, yeah, so well, there was, a, there was a, a proper investigation eventually done by a, another hospital into the care we received, which highlighted 13 significant failures and um, said that her, her death was almost certainly avoidable. Up until that point, the hospital had been trying to convince us that she died from an infection, but there was no infection. And that's not me guessing, that's the post-mortem mm. report. The microbiology and virology said there is no infection here. So when, when they were doing that to us, um, I'm an acute medicine consultant, probably 50% mm. of what I do is infections, pneumonias and cellulitis and so on. There was nothing about this that, that made that true. And we recognised if they were doing that to us, mm. and they didn't just do it once, they didn't say, oh, actually, we've made a mistake. They It went up the chain of command until eventually the board were writing to us saying, this is an infection. And, it, you know, it's, it's just truly horrific. And it's why we have this massive review needed. Yes. And as an acute medicine consultant, and I mm. understand this as a fellow medic, when mm. things go wrong, you would think that we are in a privileged position where we know things, where we get stuff done and we get answers. But that is often not the case, is it? Well, we, we got stuff done and we got answers. Um, but we, we got it almost at the cost of our own lives. Um, such dark times of trying to convince colleagues that they had made a mistake. And again, bring it back to why there's so many. One of the things in your diagnostic tree has to be, was this us? Mm. And I think this is something that the Nottingham Maternity Department is still struggling with. We know of a number of people whose babies are alive and clearly have birth injuries mm. and they're being referred for month-long genetics testing. Anything that they can do but say, do you know what, this is a birth injury. Mm. Mm. And Jack, can I ask how you and Sarah, did you reach out to other families who'd been affected in a similar way? Uh, how did you first make that, that kind of connection? Well, it was difficult. We, we Again, we recognised that things were really bad. And I think we were first on national TV in 2017, though, with, um, frankly, a lot less power um, and with a slightly different angle to the story. We recognised with our solicitor and um, PR agent that um, we would have to get more people. Mm. We were just a lone voice. And we thought of all sorts of different ways of doing that whilst broken beyond belief. Mm. Um, and being called an isolated, tragic incident, along with many other people. I think in about 2019, we met the Andrews family, whose daughter, Winter, died in what they recognised and called us about was a copy and paste of what happened to Harriet, except that Winter just survived. Um, I think we got up to about 10 families, and then all of a sudden it snowballed, and we've now got... I don't know, 220 or something in our Facebook group, all of whom describe horrific care and horrific attempts to um, not recognise that it was poor care, terrible letters being written to them, all sorts. Mm -hmm. It's why we have this. It's why we're here. And, and so poor maternity care seems to be a recurrent theme. Also, this culture of cover-up which we hear about a great deal in these institutions. You work in these hospitals. Why does that culture of cover-up cover still persist? I don't know, and I think that's a question for the independent review and for the police, really. Um, we are very clear that there's been a cover-up. People knew. We knew how to navigate the system, so um, the hospital board knew, the clinical team knew, NHS England knew, um, NHS Improvement at the time knew, the CQC knew, the General Medical Council knew, the Nursing and Midwifery Council knew, um, and none of these people have, to our minds, taken appropriate action. Nobody is accountable. Um, we think that's a big deal. Um, we are accountable for not speeding on the motorway, and if you do speed, then you there will be sanction. It appears that in Nottingham you can cause horrific harm mm. to families um, and there is nothing. All Jack the people involved in mm. Sarah's care are still working. Mm. Jack, there was a report out earlier this year that stated that we spend in the UK £8.2 
billion pounds in maternity payouts for negligence, uh, and yet we only invest three billion into maternity care. It's such a vast difference. If, if only more money was spent on maternity, which is ultimately, you know, women's health, I suppose is the umbrella term for it. And so many women, I think, will be watching this and will have felt like they've come forward to a doctor about certain things in the past and simply were not believed. Is that something that Sarah, well, you've just said, you know, it was something that Sarah experienced during her birthing experience. Yeah. Just not believed. Um, I, I always take slight, I'm slightly concerned when we call it a resourcing issue. Mm. I think that you could give, certainly the old team, I think they are trying to make changes, but I think you could give them another hundred staff a day and because of their culture, they wouldn't necessarily be any better. Mm. And of course, we've seen this in other hospitals, haven't we? We've seen similar things in West Mercia. We've th seen things at mid staffs. I've heard so many stories about this where there aren't enough staff, no one has accountability, and there's a culture of cover up, and no one seems to take the rap for what goes on. Well, that's why the police need to be involved. Yeah. Like I say, we are very clear that we blew the whistle about poor care. We used the phrase in 2016, you're conducting a cover-up, you're behaving like mid-staffs, and you wouldn't know if you had Beverly Allett working for you. And that is repeated. I think we've sent you some of those letters to your team, um, the whistleblowing letters. They're so clear, and yet they were frankly ignored. So here we are, and we think that there will be a lot of um harmed families mm. dead babies harmed babies because we were ignored yeah. and, and just in terms of this it's the largest inquiry 1800 uh, people involved in this it's an enormous undertaking but also just in terms of that if and hopefully when the inquiry actually finds what has been going on and getting to the bottom of what's been going on will that be closure for you uh, it's interesting. Um, closure doesn't exist when you've got an avoidably dead child. Um, what, it, what we want is some accountability and justice. And that might be that there is no, no one to answer for anything. It was all above board, but we don't believe that. Um, but we want to see change. And we heard the other day when we're on the news at mid the, the midwifery handover on Labour Suite, we are the problem, Sarah and I. Wow. They talk badly about us, and that is now. So, um, yeah, I it needs to change. And if this is a, another lever to make it change for, you know, the police are involved. They mm. don't get involved for no reason. Mm. So if you work at any wage, recognise the police are involved. Yeah, absolutely. And let's, you know, I just want to commend everything that yourself and Sarah are doing. Um, obviously, send our love and condolences to you both and also just really hope that you get that justice and accountability that you so much deserve. Thank you so much, Ooh, Jack Hawkins, there. Yeah, I mean, yet Thanks, again, we, we, you know, story after story, multiple failings, lack of accountability. I've heard this story so many times repeated across hospital trusts. Mm. And until this is gripped, and I'm angry about this because I have personal experience of this, where you see doctors cover up mistakes, where, and I, I can say this because it's true, mm. where I in, attended a, a particular, um, a particular um, sort of session where I could see that the medics covered up what they were doing we knew the notes had disappeared and so on. And so until you have faith in the system, nothing will change. We're seeing it so repeatedly, like you say. If, if, you, if you can't trust the police, and that, you know, constantly mm. we're being told that there's cover-ups within particularly the Metropolitan Police Force, and we can't trust nurses and the people who are supposed to be looking after our babies mm. at their most vulnerable. It just, it's, it says so much to what a sorry state the country's in at the moment. But I hope that there is hope. Yeah. And that Jack and Sarah in particular and those other families get that justice so because it's I. so... It's and I think they're, they're incredibly brave, actually, to relive the whole thing. And to well. be told that they're the problem. I know. Repeatedly. I've heard it so many times. Yeah, I bet. So many times. <sighs> well, coming up after the break, a royal return. On the eve of the anniversary of the Queen's death, Prince Harry arrives back in the UK for the Well Child Awards. I'm Dr David Bull. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. You're with Talk on TV, radio and online.
Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Uh, yes, Labour absolutely. 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the polls. No, no, no. Can Come we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs, and they bent the rules, or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the short in this <laughs> show. Oh, Michael, about Get Michael, Mark, some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my... Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should we be concerned? By this <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, Prince Harry arrived back in the UK today for the annual Well Child Awards, a charity he's been patron of for 15 years. It's unlikely he'll meet with any of the family during the brief visit, despite it being the first anniversary of his grandmother, the Queen's death tomorrow, with the King said to have no time in his diary. Well, joining us now is royal commentator and talk TV presenter and our best friend, Athea <laughs> Hagen. Thank you no. for joining us, Athea. So, Harry has landed back in the UK. Yes. So much speculation about whether Meghan's with him, as if every wife should be by her husband's side all the time. I know, right? <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've, Defensive. I've, I've left my husband at home this afternoon. <laughs> Cooking. Shock horror. Yes, he is. Actually. <laughs> he's well done very well. Um, yeah, Harry's yeah. back for the Well Child Awards. Now, like you said, he's been a patron of that charity for 15 years. And it's about children and their families, uh, with children are very unwell, and the exceptional things that they've managed to do whilst they are unwell. A really, really great mm -hmm. charity that he's been a patron of. So they have their awards. They're going to be at the Harlingham Club. Live stream starts now, if anybody wants to switch wow. over. After you've watched us, obviously. Of course. Um, and that's taking place now. And he'll be giving out an award and he'll be doing a speech as well. And yes, Megan is at home. Wow. And why not? Well, and why not? Look, it's a brilliant charity. Yes. And, and it's great that he's here and he's a patron of that. And actually celebrating these amazing uh, people, these Absolutely. amazing people is, is, is great, isn't it? I mean, there is a lot of chatter, isn't there, about Meghan and whether what's happened. T just tell us, because the headline that I was reading is about the Invictus Games. Obviously, we've spoken a great deal about that mm. as yes. well. And then Meghan mysteriously disappearing. What's that all about? Well, that's right. So Invictus Games starts on Saturday in Dusseldorf. So 
Prince Harry will be going to Dusseldorf on Saturday morning. He'll be giving a speech at the town hall, doing all sorts of PR for the games that takes place all next week. Now, Meghan was supposed to give a speech at the closing ceremony, apparently. And apparently, the running order has been updated and she's no longer on it. Now, some sources are saying that the running order was put out in error and perhaps she wasn't supposed to make a speech in the first place. But what we do know is she will be there. She will to be there to support the amazing people who will be taking part in the games and, of course, supporting Harry. And last year, she was there and she uh, made a visit to a centre for women and non-binary people. I think the most important thing is she's going to be there to witness this incredible occasion maybe she will give a speech maybe she won't but the most important thing to remember about the Invictus Games is all these incredible veterans yes. taking yes. part in this week-long festival of sport if you will absolutely and tomorrow marks the one year anniversary mm -hmm. of Queen Elizabeth passing away <laughs> neither the King nor the Prince of Wales to meet Harry on this visit with yeah, yeah his well sources saying that he just didn't have time It's a really poignant occasion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I personally would have liked, would have thought maybe there might be some sort of reconciliation, but perhaps it's just too fresh, it's just too mm. soon. The brothers haven't spoken since the release of Spare and the Harry and Meghan documentary, and Charles is going to mark the day quietly, King Charles is going to mark the day quietly with Queen Camilla at Balmoral, uh, The Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, will be at St David's Cathedral, Cathedral in Wales. And William is expected to talk about the Queen and her legacy and, mm -hmm. and to look forward to the future. So I think maybe, actually, there just wasn't space but in maybe, anybody's but, but, diary. But, but maybe maybe it's, it's not the right time. Well, I was about to say, maybe it's just the King wants to reflect on his mother. Mm -hmm. and, and it's obviously a very important moment for him. And he, maybe he doesn't want any family confrontation. I don't know. Well, and you could, you could be right about that. And actually, the dates are quite coincidental isn't it that it's the world child today and the Invictus game starts sort of Saturday and the anniversary sandwiched in between as it were and maybe it just isn't the right time there's a lot going on for everyone doesn't mean that a reconciliation is off the cards though you know I always say that Prince Harry said in his interviews in the run-up to spare that he wants a reconciliation he wants his brother back he wants his father back He wants that family back. Mm. And I don't think that that is, you know, inconceivable. Mm -hmm. It could happen. I think it will happen, but just not now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about my favourite story yeah. uh, that involves Prince of Wales, Pret <laughs> yes. and Gaza? Right. So three words I never thought <laughs> would go together nope. in a sentence. So the Prince of William has been out on manoeuvres today as well. He was visiting Bournemouth AFC, and then visited a press a manger and this is to do with his homelessness, um, charity, yeah. and Gaza was there. And that literally is all I can say about that. What? Gaza was there, bumped into him, shaking hands, had a little kiss there, totally random. Totally on, random. You don't go around kissing but, the prince, do you? If well, you're Gaza, you apparently, can do it. Like. It, it, to be honest, Nicola is a thousand percent correct. <laughs> if you are... Gaza, you know, <laughs> the no protocols of Gaza. You can it. just do what you want, but yeah, Prince William out there. Um, he supporting didn't know what Pratt. to do, did he? He didn't. <laughs> but the thing is, if Gaza leaned in, I don't know what I would do. But he held himself well, having a nice little chat there, and yeah, he's out there promoting his homelessness <laughs> charity. Gaza looks really pleased. Very pleased But indeed. But the thing is, imagine you just walked into Pret. You're, you're doing the Pret dance in front of the fridges. Am I going to have the a Pret chicken? dance? You know when you don't know what sandwich to get and people just sort of circle around <laughs> like Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know, I, know, I know, I know. So you're doing the Pret dance in front of the fridges <laughs> and there's Prince William. Yeah. I'd kiss Or him do you too. think he knew he was going and then he went? <laughs> I think he probably he's got He's got game on that as well, hasn't he? There's chances of him actually going <laughs> yeah. and just bumping into the oh, Prince totally. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, everybody there looks super pleased to see Prince William. He's taking lots of selfies, spent loads of time with the crowd and that's what people love don't mm. they and mm. so you know give them i will certainly be getting going down a print and see if i can <laughs> <laughs> just hang around <laughs> waiting wow. for harry sophia is there no like public uh, not not a celebration obviously but public memorial to mark the passing of the queen it just seems so odd for it to be one year on and there not really be anything that i'm aware of at least And that's what a lot of us have been saying, actually, mm. that there is no sort of firm in stone commemoration. And I think a year since the passing, that is something a lot of people would have wanted. Mm. Um, but no, it's not really happening. Like I said, the Prince and Princess of Wales are going to be at St. David's Cathedral in Wales. Uh, they'll visit the cathedral. They're going to mark it quite quietly. Uh, and then, of course, King Charles III and Queen Camilla will still be on summer holidays in Balmoral. They'll be marking it privately and quietly. So there is no, you know, memorial service or mm. any sort of 
really public commemoration of this day. Mm. I do think that the royal family have missed a trick on that because well, I, I, I think there's mm. lots of people who would have really um, relished, is that the word, or would have really appreciated being part of a public commemoration. And a celebration of her life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe there might be something planned for five years down the line or ten years down the line, or perhaps when a permanent memorial to Queen Elizabeth well, II is unveiled, they'll maybe use that opportunity. We know that they, they're still in a decision on what that will be. What should it, it be? be? I think, you know, like a statue like the one of Queen Victoria would be Looking something down the mall. would be something very fitting and something very beautiful. And you know, places have to really apply to be named after Queen Elizabeth II. So I think something like that as well would be Amazing. would be really mm. lovely. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Fia Hagen. Are you doing the talk tonight? Of course. Okay, you can catch Fear back <laughs> on this me. very sofa with, with David yes. at nine o'clock. Double trouble. <laughs> very jealous. <laughs> right. so. Coming up after the break, the search <laughs> continues. Police say they're working working around the clock to trace missing prisoner Daniel Khalif, but so far there have been no confirmed sightings. I'm Nicola Thorpe. And I'm Dr David Bull, and you're with Talk here on TV, on radio and online. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Returning to one of our top stories now. With escaped terror suspect Daniel Khalif still at large, the police this evening said there have been no confirmed sightings of him since he escaped from Wandsworth Prison yesterday morning. 
Huge queues are forming at the country's ports as a manhunt is underway for the missing fugitive. Meanwhile, an investigation has been launched into why the 21-year-old was being held in a Category B prison, with the Shadow Justice Secretary demanding answers in the Commons earlier. It simply beggars belief that a man being held on suspected terror charges was able to escape a prison by clinging to the bottom of a food delivery van. The simplest question for the Justice Secretary today is how on earth was this allowed to happen? How is such an escape even possible? Why was a suspected uh, terror offender held at a Category B uh, jail whilst on remand, despite many other suspected and indeed convicted terrorists being held in the high security uh, estate? Why was Daniel Khalife moved from Belmarsh to Wandsworth? Well, joining us again in the studio is General Secretary of the Prison Officers Association, Steve Gillen. Thank you so much for coming back. Obviously, we'll be following this story as it develops. I'm reading uh, reports here, so, but the suspicions that this could have almost certainly been an inside job. In your experience, what would that potentially entail? I, I don't know, no. and I, I don't really know the details. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the, the media speculation, if that's from a police source, yeah. then it may be for the police to investigate. Mm -hmm. There will be clear investigations into this because we heard the Shadow Justice Secretary there um, effectively asking a series of questions. I can't answer those questions mm -hmm. because I'd be speculating, quite mm. frankly, and I think it's best left to the investigation team mm. uh, to actually do that rather than speculate about how, why and when. Mm -hmm. so, so earlier on we were talking about why on earth was he not in a Category A prison. Could you just explain to us the difference between Category A? I saw you nodding along when we said there is no way he would have escaped from a Category A, and yet he did escape from a Category B. What's the difference? Well, you've got to be a little bit careful with that because people have escaped from Cat A prisons. Uh, in the 1990s, there was um, some escapes by IRA prisoners from Whitemoor Prison, and then again at Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight, mm -hmm. which, you know, uh, led to massive reports. The Learmont report came out after that, and security was massively tightened up in the Category A estate and around the prison system as well. Um, th the main difference is Category A prisons uh, are for the very highest category of prisoners that would be an absolute danger to the public if they were to escape. And then you've got the cat bees, which is just as dangerous, actually, but not under the extreme conditions that Category A prisons uh, would be. And then you've got Category C for the less categories, and then, of course, you get your open estate, cat Ds. And what could be the reason why he was kept in Category B, then? Is it because of a low risk uh, well, he was considered a flight risk, but perhaps not as dangerous according to the allegations, or is it because he was kept away perhaps from an accomplice? What could those have been? Maybe his age? Could be a whole variety of issues, but at this moment in time, I'm struggling mm. with that as well. Yeah. And there's no use me saying, well, he should have been in a Cat A prison. There may be, have been a variety of reasons mm. why he wasn't. Now, we have raised with the prison service over the years about categorization of prisoners. And I suspect sometimes it comes down to space mm. because of overcrowding and different things. Now, if you remember back uh, a few years ago, there was a spate of dangerous prisoners absconding from open conditions. Mm. And the warnings went out from the police not to approach them, bewildering given that they're in an open estate with no fence around, why were they recategorized so quickly? Mm. So there could be a potential problem there, but I'm sure this investigation will look into all that because quite rightly, uh, not just the shadow secretary of state is asking that particular question, but I know that Alex Chalk mm. is asking that particular question as well. And they'll have to have the answers yeah. in relation to that. I, and I await those answers as well, so as that we can say, you know, that it's inappropriate or not. Mm. But I think we'll all become a little bit wiser when the investigation is complete. I'll tell you what, when Alex Chalk said today that he wants the invest a preliminary report within a week, 
Oh, but the quickest investigation I've ever seen in the prison service. <laughs> so, so earlier on, actually, I bumped into Peter Blexley, former Metropolitan uh, Police Officer, who was saying that actually, in terms of this, there's a lot of speculation about this, there about is. straps being underneath the van, whether it was premeditated, whether this was an inside job or whether it was an outside job. He said something quite interesting to me. He said the Justice Secretary seemed very confident that he would be caught. He repeated it multiple times. Do you think the Justice Secretary knows something? I mean, it's pure speculation. Do you think the Justice Secretary knows something that maybe the rest of us don't? I hope he does, and I hope this individual is caught very, very quickly if he poses a threat uh, to the security of Great Britain uh, and the general public at large, then we need him caught as quickly as mm. possible. Uh, would Alex Chalk make those remarks if he wasn't confident? No, Alex Chalk, I don't think he would make so, those exactly. remarks. So maybe he is briefed at top level mm. by... Uh, police and counter-terrorism officers that I'm unaware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to give a little bit of an update here, Police Commander Dominic Murphy um, has come out to say that allegedly Khalif is believed to have been strapped to the bottom of this vehicle, as we already know, left HMP Wandsworth at 7.32am. He was then declared missing at 7.50am. Police were then notified at quarter past eight and mm -hmm. the van was actually stopped on Upper Richmond Drive at 8.37 a.m. Yet we in the media weren't alerted to this till three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. So there's such a vast time difference there between the police being notified that there was a runaway prisoner and then the press being informed so people could actually look out for him. Mm. Is that standard procedure? I'm, I'm not sure why there mm. was that time delay without looking at all the different components in relation to it. Uh, I understood at Wandsworth yesterday, there was obviously a complete lockdown, mm. which is normal if they think that a prisoner isn't accounted for. Uh, and that can take some time to then count the role because you heard, this more, you heard earlier that he could be hiding somewhere uh, in the establishment. And I know you yeah. find that difficult to understand, but there's a thing now called free flow in prisons where they go to work, um, and you, you may send 50 prisoners to a workshop. You may send 15 or 20 prisoners uh, But wouldn't you know kitchens. where they are in the prison? Well, you should know where they yeah. are. I mean, that's basic security. But the point I'm making, and I've made uh, on many media uh, interviews, is that security seems to have taken a back seat uh, to the way that I know it. Now, we, we've raised this with Alec Chalk, mm. that we need to get back to a disciplined service. 100%. Because that's what the general public expect. Mm. And I understand there'll be pressure groups that will say, we can't be harsh on this issue, we can't mm. be harsh on that. Mm. But, you know, my members at different establishments, horrendous assaults, and I think mm. a Member of Parliament mm. mentioned today that they visited Wandsworth Prison a couple of weeks back, and as they were visiting, six members of staff, prison officers, were been taken to hospital after being viciously wow. assaulted. That's what we're seeing on a daily basis up and down the country. Mm. Thousands of officers every year being assaulted viciously. And that cannot go on. It can't. Absolutely right. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us. Uh, thank you to Steve Gillen there. Coming up after the break, after 12 beautiful years in Bonnie, Scotland, Edinburgh Zoo's giant pandas are going home to China. I'm Dr David Bull. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. We're sitting in for Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio and online. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. You believe you can win this war? Well, you're making me cry again. They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah.
Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I obviously wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Uh, yes. Labour are 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the polls. No, no, can no. we? Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! Yeah. Yes. If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off short. <laughs> <and it's laughs> no, no, Get her out! Mark, Get her out. Mark, Mark, some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should we be concerned? By this <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's the joke. Welcome back. Now, before we move on to pandas, <laughs> Jeremy Kyle is here to tell us what's coming up at 7 pm. Jez, what you got on the show? Pandas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Great segue. <laughs> What, what, what about well, pandas? Well, you tuned. can stick around if you like, yeah. and we can right, talk okay. with you about pandas. Uh, listen, obviously more about Daniel Abid Khalif, the, uh, the, the prisoner who escaped from Wandsworth. We've got Bobby Kasanga on the show tonight, former gang member who was in Wandsworth Prison, who will tell us exactly how you can break out of Wandsworth oh. Prison. The security is not what it was. There's been a big argument about how this guy who, if you remember, was in the armed forces, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This man was arrested and was awaiting trial for having... Uh, made fake bombs. So there is exactly. a terrorist, the terrorist effect to this story. And of course, he was due to be on trial in November, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. But he should have been in Belmarsh, and that's the big story. Uh, Harry's back in England. You're on. Nick's going to go, oh, lovely, come on. <laughs> She's nowhere to be seen, but who wants to see her? Because she'll get booed. Plus, of course, tomorrow, I just honestly, you know those moments in your life when you remember where you were when Her Majesty the Queen died at yes. 10 past mm. three a year ago? Mm -hmm. And the whole, I was, I was doing a voiceover for it. 330,000 people queued for 17 hours to go mm -hmm. and see her lying in state. An amazing outpouring of emotion. And just looking at what's happened since, really, where we are as a nation and what it means for the royal family, plenty on Harry and Meghan. And, and also, obviously, um, and I've got to get this absolutely right, we're, we're going to look into nitrous oxide tonight, right? <laughs> yes, get it right. It, well, don't start. It's <laughs> NOS, isn't it? NOS gas, I yes. got it. I got it. I named it wrong earlier. No, no, no. <laughs> so not, I didn't say NOS, so it's something else. Yes. But anyway, uh, this has been graded a C, a legal drug. We have somebody on us says it should be far worse than that. This is a really? dreadful, dreadful drug. Yes, but then you go back. We talked about we it yesterday. We spoke about it on the show yesterday. Oh, they're all the hippies well, on the we, drive show. Well, yeah. no, no, but the point is... Let's we, legalise every drug. No, yeah? it wasn't that. It was about what the classification of drug, drugs really means and whether it is actually effectual. And I come For from me, Jess, it's got to be about education. I think that younger people would Lock take it if they knew... 
tweezers and the takers and just deal with it. No, I know what you mean. Absolutely. If people, if, if kids knew, because you know, you take it through a balloon, which feels quite childlike and it's easily accessible, you can buy somebody to. And you see all those celebrities, internet. all those footballers and stuff. Do you know they were having laughing gas parties in the 1700s before even I was born? That was the Victorian <laughs> drug of choice. Is wasn't that right? It? Yeah, I think so. Right. Also, gin was, by the way. Really? Yes, yeah, mother's She ruined. likes a gin. Don't yes. I love a gin. Mother's, mother's ruined. Get me a double. <laughs> right. So tell me about pandas. No, we'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> Shall I stay or go? No, go. Uh, thank you very much. No. I'm staying now. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> He's well, staying uh, now. You've I want to see your socks. Got the camera panning on <laughs> no, your socks. No, they can't. No, they can't. <laughs> Get panning on his socks. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with my socks. It's a very hot day. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Right, moving on to our final story. And for more than a decade, Tian Tian and Yang Guang have been Edinburgh Zoo's most famous residents. But 12 years on, it is time for the furry duo oh. to head home. On loan from Beijing, the pair have attracted millions of visitors with their playful antics on the zoo's panda cam and even have become a symbol of the UK's relationship with China. And while they've failed to produce any offspring, the zoo paid tribute to the pair, saying they've had an incredible impact on visitors. Well, joining us now is Sam Hogg, founder of Beijing to Britain, a company that provides analysis into our relationship with China. And now you're talking about pandas, <laughs> which I think is crucial because we have a very strange relationship with China at the moment. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. But one thing we do love in the UK oh, no. is a panda. Um, people are going to be devastated about this, surely. They are. I mean, pandas are a fantastic piece of soft power from the Chinese government, the Chinese state. They sort of lease them across the world. People go along, they visit with their kids, with their families. As you say, who doesn't love a panda bear? So that's really interesting. Yeah. You say it's soft, soft power bear. from China. I mean, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about China's influence in this country and in the Western world generally. The fact is we're so reliant on all sorts of things from uh, the Chinese, particularly IT, also in terms of energy infrastructure, all that kind of thing, telephone, masks and so on. So in some ways, does this makes China look rather nicer? That's a theory. That's the idea behind it. Although, you know, when these guys arrived, when this delightful pair arrived in the UK 12 years ago, President Xi was not yet in his position. A lot has changed in that decade since. And perhaps 12 years ago, people might associate that with a friendly, cuddly China, but that is not the way, for the reasons you've outlined just there, that people associate now with China at all. Mm. That's so smart. I'd never thought about this. We thought this was going to be a literally light and fluffy item <laughs> about pandas, but you're so right. It, it, for, for for a young age, young people will associate China with this this sort of <laughs> harmless, gorgeous bear. But they're renowned for not being very good breeders, aren't they? That's correct. I mean, I think again, I'll caveat this by saying I'm not a panda bear expert. <laughs> that being said, I think there's an argument that actually they are almost on their way to um, dying out, regardless, because they are so poor at survival skills in general. You know, yes. they just sort of stumble around the place eating bamboo. And why are they being sent back? Is China demanding them back? Are we sending them back because they haven't produced an heir? I think they've just come to the end of their lease, as mm. it were. Mm. And the idea was for the breeding program, as you rightly say, of course, it hasn't gone very well, has no, it? No, exactly. Two pandas, not three, heading back. Yeah, which is really, really desperately sad. Can I just be serious for the moment and just talk about this? Because politicians are very um, confused, I think, about the threat that China faces or, or the threat that China imposes on, on countries like this one. How worried should we be about the role of China? So I think it's a really complex question. And China is not a monolith. China is a billion plus people with a authoritarian government. But you know, a billion plus people who pay tax, want to watch football, want to put their kids through school. It's, it's more complex than that. And the good news is that many other, I mean, it's good news in a sense, many other governments around the world are trying to work out their relationship with China too. I think you're absolutely right to say that there's a, a confusion around what our strategy is. And politicians here from all stripes would say that too. Mm. The government, on the other hand, says, well, we've got a strategy. It's protect align and engage. We set that out six months ago. That's our strategy. But it's, it's hard, you know. Yeah. It really is very hard. Protect, align and engage. engage. But the question is, how much do you engage? You know, we're all guilty of buying cheap Chinese goods, aren't we? And we talked earlier about the Internet of Things. The fact is they're all listening to everything we do. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example of one of the hardest things with the China conversation is separating fear from reality yeah. and perhaps uh, what's exaggerated from what we need to be concerned about. And that, that often can be very hard, very blurred, as it were. Because, you know, at a base level, very few people in the UK speak Mandarin. So how are you meant to read primary sources? How are you meant to understand what people are saying in, in China, what the government is saying? 
And it's a really complex issue for all the reasons you've outlined just there. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're a massive trading partner for us. They support thousands of jobs here. They produce investment coming in the way. Yeah. It's just not as simple as cut them off. No. Can you talk to us a just very, very briefly, this is my personal interest, uh, about TikTok and uh, mm. ByteDance, the yeah, umbrella correct. company, because yeah. they really are influencing younger people in the UK now. So, so the way that TikTok works is that TikTok has, has a parent company, as you say, ByteDance, and the concerns are sort of multifaceted with TikTok. On the one hand, is TikTok sending user data back to China? They would say absolutely not. We've made that very clear. The other one that's more complex, actually, is what are we putting in front of young people? Absolutely. And as we come towards an election, what are we seeing? And, and how do you differentiate between fake news? Well, you've got Grant Shapps is on it, the defense exactly. secretary. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what's that about? Well, I mean, he's now, now he's defense secretary, he's supposed to be sort of swearing off it. But he was his view and the view of many politicians actually around the world is that it's a perfect way to communicate with young people. I mean, where else do you get to hear a politician's views with a sort of snappy song behind it? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Very, I like that very, dance move. Very true. Um, I, uh, Thank you very much, Sam. You did a great job talking about pandas Thank and, of you. course, about China as well. Thank you very Thank much you indeed uh, for coming. I find, I find this absolutely fascinating, what Sam was talking about, the role of China, what we do. Mm -hmm. This is all about foreign policy. But again, really mixed messages from government because I don't think they know what to do. No, absolutely. You're right with, with the mixed messages. And also, I love so much, David, Let's that we were pandas. supposed to talk about pandas <laughs> and, and we turned it into such a highly I know. political I know, <laughs> I know. But, uh, and, and I have to say, I mean, when we go back to the pandas, how can you not love that panda? Aren't they just gorgeous? I just feel so sad. We're actually, at the age of 20, she's considered an OAP, which is an Wonder old age panda. <laughs> God bless Hasn't her. She, she's actually gone grey as well, apparently. She has around the face at only 20 years old. Mind you, I found my first grey at 23. Did so, you? Yeah, we're can't not see so any. different after all. I can't see any. Well, I use box dye. She doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I've got grey hair as well, I have to tell you. <laughs> Wonderful. I don't believe you for a second. <laughs> well, it's, it's well sadly, on that note, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. We've really loved sitting in for Vanessa, who will be back on Monday, no doubt tanned, relaxed and hopefully loved up from all of her time on Celebs Go Dating. Wow, yes, thank you for having us and please do join Rosie Wright, who'll be here same time tomorrow. Up next is the man himself, Jeremy Carl. A very good night to you.